All right, I am Jamie Stegmeyer here, and I am here with a special guest, Elizabeth Hargrave, the designer of Wingspan and other games that we're going to talk about today. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining me for this uh, design discussion. Hey there. Yeah, so I reached out to Elizabeth to ask if she would be willing to join me on my game design channel to talk about the design process for Wingspan, her kind of thoughts uh, now. I, I phrase it as a retrospective, a re retrospective look back on Wingspan, even though Wingspan is still somewhat in the works. We still have a few expansions that that might come out someday. So uh, thank you for for revisiting this. And for just for context, uh, can you let everyone know what something that you've been working on for a museum recently that might put some of this information fresh on your mind? Yes. Yeah, so there is a museum in Rochester, New York, called the Strong Museum of Play. Um, and they have a really amazing collection that I had the opportunity to visit last year. They have like one of the original copies of Monopoly by um, Lizzie Maggie and and um, lots of cool stuff. And so they have been reaching out to some board game designers and asking them to um, send in like old prototypes and other so i've been trying to go through some of the stuff on my shelf and and like actually make sense of it for them before i send it to them yeah, um yeah. another cool project that they have actually is that they have all of sid saxon's diaries oh, and wow. they have made images of all the pages and they're asking people to go in and help transcribe them so you can actually go and like transcribe a few pages of sid saxon's diaries when you have a fair a few <laughs> one day um it's kind of fun to see he was a meticulous note taker i am not no <laughs> <laughs> but emails serve a lot of the same purpose especially because you and i like a lot of what we have done over the years with development has all been by email that's true yeah yeah so i, I originally met elizabeth at gen con i can never forget i can't remember exactly what year. did you do you know which 20... year we actually met 2015 16. 16, 2016. So I met Elizabeth there. And then from then on, for a long period of time, we were just emailing about the game. And that's generally what we still do now. We email about expansions and whatnot. So you're right. There's a long written track record. Have you? Did you look back and, and see any emails or notes of paths not taken where now looking back on it, you were like, oh, that, that might have been a little interesting to do, or I'm really glad we didn't do that. Anything pop out? Like that? I think the one that my local playtesters remember most strongly was we went down this path. We were trying to figure out if there was some way to have a shared board for Wingspan, like something that players were interacting with in the middle of the table. Yeah. And um, I tried a rondelle at one point where you mm -hmm. were like driving your truck around your park, which was super <laughs> cute, but did not really work very well mechanically. And and the I think the biggest feedback that came out of that whole sort of wild goose chase of like, you know, because I tried other things too in the middle of the table and every the feedback we got was just like, I just want to pay attention to the birds, which I really took to heart. Um, and I think it's yeah. sort of, we doubled down on that direction after a while, um, which I think was the right decision. I recently played Earth. Have you played Earth? Yeah, yeah. So Earth, I think we're in a, an era of these amazing tableau building games. And I think Wingspan is one of them. I think Earth is one of them, one that I've really enjoyed. And I've heard one of the criticisms for Earth is that it's that you don't really pay attention to other players all that much. But I am finding in a tableau building game, I don't really care. Like at the end of the game, I want to look at what you built, what your planet or your what island looked like. But during the game, I want to focus on this cool tableau that I'm building. And the same goes in Wingspan. I'm not looking for interaction in a shared space i'm looking for the cool things that i'm building and the cool birds that i'm putting on my mat do you do you feel like that with with tableau builders i yes yeah. and and you know people call it multiplayer solitaire sometimes and i'm like yeah that's a good thing if i hear <laughs> yeah, yeah. Solitaire, yeah. That's like that's my personal taste in games but yeah. i do think both earth and wingspan if you're playing at an advanced level they do have mm -hmm. opportunities to pay attention so in yeah. earth you've got that mechanic where you're um, where everybody gets to follow on your action and do something a little bit smaller, but then they trigger all of their birds in that category, much like Wingspan, um, yeah. except you can trigger on someone else's turn. And so like, you do want to be paying attention, right, to what other people have. And the same as the like between turns, birds and the pink mm -hmm. birds in, in Wingspan, right? Like if you're playing at a really advanced level, you are paying attention to what pink powers other people have and thinking harder about whether you want to trigger those. 
Yeah. Um, or maybe if you get a pink power that triggers off of predators, you're looking at what predators other people have or not. And that. So the, yeah, yeah. I think there's a little bit more interaction than some people realize at first, but also like I, yeah, I just enjoy building my own thing. And that comes through in a lot of my games. <laughs> Well, and eventually, I guess with Wingspan Asia, you did add a shared yeah. space for two players to interact with. It was that, yes. uh, that was one of the great delights, I think, when you shared Wingspan Asia with me, that you had found a way to do that in a way that still felt like I was mostly paying attention to my own board. And there was a little surprise, almost a little extra bonus whenever I played a bird. Yeah. What, uh, where did that come from? Partly it came from the fact that you wanted to make Asia, well... A, a standalone two-player game and I was trying to figure out a way that um that the goals could be more interesting in a two-player game because I find in Wingspan yeah. often when I play with the original set of goals or that structure will end up where each of the two players wins on two of them and you sort of cancel each other out yeah. um and the whole goal board becomes a net of zero points for both players which is just less interesting so i was trying to come up with a, a way that um that the end of round goals could be more interesting for people in in that two-player okay. game that's interesting that you built that the, the whole really great mechanism around that idea yeah i like that that's actually touched upon i have a few questions that i rewrote for this uh, or that i wrote for this and one of them was about um there's a couple about this topic a little bit, but is uh, what elements of Wingspan looking back so far, and we're having this discussion, if you're watching this well in the future, we're, we're having this discussion after the core game has come out and after three expansions, European, Oceania, and Asia have been released. Um, so far, what elements of Wingspan have you been the happiest about? Are, are there any mechanisms that you are just elated that ended up that you, that you created that you put in Wingspan or anything about the process that you're happy about that you wanted to mention? You know, when I first pitched to you, one of the feedback, the pieces of feedback was that it needed more engine building because it, mm. it was super light on that mm. front, um, quite different turn structure. And so one of the biggest things that we added in development was um, what I think of as like a double layer of engine building. Uh -huh. So the birds themselves have the powers on them that trigger and um with each habitat and on top of that you're playing them onto this board that makes your turns stronger um as you play birds onto them so even if you're playing birds that don't build your engine themselves they are building your engine just purely by going onto your board right. and i feel like that like two layers to the engine building just like really is so satisfying um yeah and gives you a, such a strong feeling of forward progression. Um, so I think that's, if I have to point to the secret sauce of Wingspan, I think it's that, like the satisfaction of building in that way. That's one of my favorite parts about it as well. And I would add to it something that I, I my memory could be wrong. I think you pushed for this and I'm so glad you did because I typically, when I often design games, I try to avoid the round structure as much as possible. And I remember early on in Wingspan's development that it ended up really feeling like a race, like everything was driven. It was like the goal was to play eight birds or 10 birds, whatever it was. And this is even after we had built in some of that engine building elements. And I, you can speak more to this, but I think you found that playtesters were just so focused on that, that they weren't actually running their engine or, or valuing their engine during the game. They were just trying to play one more bird so that you race to it. What, what's your recollection about why you changed that yeah. and what the round structure the, added? The round structure was one of the very last things that we added. Mm -hmm. And it was both what you described that sometimes people felt like too much pressure of the race, but also there were weird situations where the, the game end trigger was like 10 birds or some number of eggs, I forget. Yeah. And um, so it was like a player took an action that caused the game to end. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people would be in a situation where they didn't think they were ahead. So they didn't want to play that 10th bird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they have this weird like, but what do I do now? Um, and it's just weird. And at the uh -huh. simultaneous with that, we had the um, the competitive goals mm -hmm. um, pretty well worked out what they should be. 
and we wanted three or four of them. It seemed like the right number, but it was a lot to pay attention to all at once throughout the course of the game. And so switching to the the round structure also allowed us to like assign one goal to each round and give people more focus at, at different points in the game on different things. So it was like switching to that round structure solved two problems at once. Um, and uh yeah once we tried it we were just like oh yeah this is the right answer but you were the one that came up with the different number of turns per round because we were oh, yeah. calculating yeah. out i think i had a bunch of playtest data that was like okay this is sort of the typical number of turns that people have been taking um before the round structure and so how do we want to split up this typical number of turns across rounds and you came up with the idea of eight seven six five that's the right number. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Using that that extra token to place on the uh, the goal yeah. mat and remove right, it. Yeah. Right. Right. So it's yeah. like all these things just came together at once. And then the mm -hmm. fact that we were using the cubes to track the number of turns per round also gave us a thing to like physically mark which bird you were activating during the turn, which also was like yes. a helpful little mnemonic that hadn't existed before that. Um, so yeah, a whole bunch of things sort of all came together with this one little tweak. And, and later on, I think you even pulled those cubes into the game uh, with the end of round goals, I believe, where sometimes you right. look at which actions you took or didn't take at the end of the round. So having that tangible reminder of which actions you took ended up being really helpful for further design. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing that I really value about you, you mentioned some data here and analysis is that uh, and, and you correct me if I'm wrong, you come across as very data oriented. You're looking at a lot of data. You have a, an amazing spreadsheet that maybe you'll share with the world someday. Uh, I get to see it. But uh, that's something that I really value. When I ask about like what elements of Wingspin are you the happiest about? Are you happy that you created a giant spreadsheet that that does all these calculations? Or it doesn't, it doesn't really do it. You're inputting information in there, but it helps you. I think it helps you balance these cards. Oh, definitely. Talk about that a little yeah. bit. Yeah. I mean I don't know how I would have done it without a spreadsheet. I uh -huh. feel like in yeah. any situation in my entire life that involves like more than 10 piece, pieces of information and ends up in a spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's and that's a, a thing that I'm just comfortable with from my previous day job. And, and um, so it just comes very naturally to me. But yeah, I mean, keeping track of the information for all of these different birds and all of the pieces of information that is on each one of them, alone would call for a spreadsheet. And then the way that I calculate the scores on each bird is like taking those pieces of information and adding them all together. And I like, if I had to do that by hand for each one, it would have been incredibly time consuming. And also just a lot of decision fatigue. I feel like if uh, uh, in games where people are sort of trying to hand assign a score to each thing, right? You have to like figure out what each one was. and. And I just like came up with a with some rules to to make it all work, which I think is necessary when you've got that many cards. And just to make yeah. it and so people, you know, say a lot of times that it feels really balanced, maybe with a few exceptions, but um that I, I think it comes from sort of having a really strong system in place for how what things are worth and how that all interacts. How do you plug? I'm, I'm curious. So I've tried to design deck building games. And one of the things I really struggle with that is putting a cost on the cards. I, I can, you know, it, it's easier to, it's easy to say like two coins equals one victory point. But once you get into a, an ability that is circumstantial sometimes, and you know, it's, that those two coins might mean two different very things based on the scenario. How do you, how do you build that into the formula? The, the power, like the many different powers that are in wingspan. Yeah, it so right. I have sort of assigned values behind the scenes to everything that you might get from a bird power. An egg is worth one point, is the most right. obvious one, right? Um, a lot of other things are also worth one point in my math, <laughs> just to make it easy. Sure. Um, but also, you know, less tangible things like play another bird, like what is it worth? Mm. It's giving you another turn, basically, and those sorts of things. Um, but the, the hardest thing with a deck builder and engine builder is that you have to make some sort of assumption about how many times that's going to get activated. Yeah, and yeah. so I just sort of picked a value in the middle of like, uh -huh. assume that each bird is played in the middle of the game and how many more times will you get to activate it during the game? Um, 
so some of the stronger powers probably get activated more than that and it can escalate a little bit and i've gotten a little more comfortable more careful about that <laughs> over time <laughs> but um but yeah you just have to it, some of it really is you just have to pick something and that's what makes engine builders interesting to play i think is that as you get better you can see when you're in a situation where that bird is worth more to you than what the designer assumed and that's like part of the game is figuring yeah. out like oh yeah this high point bird i don't want to play that till the end of the game and it's worth a lot of the end of the game and it doesn't matter that it doesn't have a power on it or this low point bird that has a really great power i want to play that early mm -hmm. um and it's actually worth less to play it at the end of the game. And, and that's like part of the game is figuring out, finding those places where something's worth to you, worth more to you in the moment than than what it might appear. So. I, I love that you said that. I, that is one of the, the great joys that I experienced from playing Wingspan. I, I think a lot of people experience that too. The, the order of operations, when you, and that decision point in the order of operations, when do I play this bird? Even if you send, end up with the same bird in multiple games, depending on when you play it, it could end up feeling very differently and where right. you play what it. What else you have going on, right? Like, do you right. have something that's giving you seeds that's going to feed your goose or whatever, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm curious then, so along this way, along the last few years, a lot of people have played Wingspan and a lot of people have shared their creativity as well. We've seen house rules. We've seen fan-made cards. We've seen mega Wingspan. Sometimes you keep seeing photos of uh, people rank the cards. How, how do you balance, and I, I know you're pretty amazing at, uh, at keeping an eye on that information and seeing what people are, are excited about, but how do you balance that versus you being the person who knows Wingspan better than anyone else in the world? And I think you are the best equipped to make the best decisions for Wingspan players, balancing that with these other things that you see people talk about. How, how do you reconcile that? How do you do that? I'm not sure I would say anymore that I'm the person that knows Wingspan the best in the world. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Like competitively, I, yeah, someone might, like, yeah. The people in the Facebook group and like they're instantly yeah. being able to answer things. Or people sometimes will come up to me and like ask me about a specific bird card by name. And I'm like, I don't oh. remember <laughs> card. I am sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and that's often because I really have my head in whatever the next expansion is that I'm working on. Like, I'm not mm. playing Wingspan the way that other people are playing Wingspan. If I'm playing, it's mostly with new cards. And so I'm not, like, seeing the older cards as much. Um, but how do I stay on top of that? And feel, I, don't, I mean... Yeah, and, and that's fine, right? Like, there are other people out there now that will answer all the rules questions for me, which is, like, just amazing and mind-blowing to see. And there's all these people out there with, like, strategy YouTube channels and whatever. Like, great. Like, I'm yeah. playing it. You can advise people, and I don't have to. Uh -huh. Um but then, like, a lot of people post, yeah, the house rules and the, like, ideas for new cards and stuff I do try to stay on top of more <laughs> than the other, like, more general strategy stuff. And I actually, um, it started as a Google Doc and has now become a spreadsheet. I have a <laughs> spreadsheet that, um, where I try to keep that stuff. And then um, when I am working on the next thing, I sort of go through that and, and we'll pull ideas and, and think about um ideas that people have had um so that's actually super helpful because i at the end of working on each expansion i feel pretty tapped out in terms of new ideas and so that sort of helps keep things going yeah one thing and, and correct me if i'm wrong if this came from some other source but i know so, something that some people have said is that they want the game to last a little longer and you mm -hmm. added a goal i think maybe in oceania the uh the no goal expand uh, no goal uh no go goal, right? Right. It's a, it's a tile that says you don't have a goal and therefore you are not moving your player token over to the goal mat. You're keeping it. You have that extra action for the rest of the game. Did that come from? Yes. Okay, it did. Okay. Is there anything yeah, else? That, that came that you from could... people yeah. like house ruling and like adding an extra yeah. cube to their games to have more turns. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Type of the, are there anything else like that that comes to mind of? Oh, that's uh, I know good. there are many influences, but there's definitely individual birds that have that, pe mm -hmm. are things that people have suggested. I'm trying to think. Yeah, I can't think of specific examples. Um, well, the so the other side of of Wingspan Asia, you know, that there's the two player version, but then 
I was like, oh, if we're putting two players worth of stuff in the box, then that would allow people to have the stuff for seven players, which is crazy. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but you, I have seen over the years a few times on the Wingspan Facebook group that people play these big games where they like mash two boxes of Wingspan together and have, you know, eight people or something playing all at once and it takes five hours. <laughs> I was just like, there has to be something we could do for these people. <laughs> um, and I'm actually yeah. really happy with how that came out too. Like oh yeah, you seven players of wingspan in an hour and a half. Yeah, I was hoping I could pull out the flock mode or yeah, the flock mode thing here. I have uh, the nesting box right next to it. I don't have that particular tile handy. Yeah, that's incredible that, that you figured that out. I think early on when you were thinking about that, I had just played a six-player game of wingspan where I just brought an extra mat and played along. Uh -huh. And I was like, I know you have probably experienced it, but I was like, I, I don't think we can just throw in another player. We have to do something here. And, and you came up with the flock mode because it just took too long. It's like a three and a half hour game. Yeah. With six players. Yeah. This is pre-flock mode. Um, <laughs> um, okay. Uh, one of the questions, I have a couple, a couple other questions. Um, if you could go back to yourself when you were designing Wingspan, 2016, 2017, 2018, around that time. Um, is there anything that you added later that you would tell your past self to do this differently or to add this thing that you didn't even think of until you got to the Asia expansion or, or later down the road? Is there anything that you kind of wish was in there earlier? And I can think of one thing, but I'm curious if you could think of anything. There's one like kind of obvious answer, I think, that that most people don't even realize is new, but the Swift Start Guide, I think, is the... Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. So we didn't realize that Wingspan would be so broadly received by non-gamers. And so after a few printings of the game, Elizabeth came up with the Swift Start Guide concept that that onboards you into the game. That was the one thing that came to mind for me, that I, if I had known that, I probably would have advocated for, for that early in the game. Because yeah. Wingspan, I think, is a fairly easy game to teach as a gamer, but as a non-gamer, there's a big learning curve. Yeah, and it's. It, I'm sure you've seen the video of Mandy Patinkin. Even reading the Swift Start Guide is like overwhelming to some people. <laughs> but we did what we could. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, and I think that was the idea of um, Dusty Crane, who does the mill. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Oh, wouldn't it be cool if they had something like the Fog of Love? Does it really nice? That's right. Fog of Love does have. A, yeah. Um. Yeah. What else? I don't know. I, I love the round end the, ability. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, right. Like the the. I mean, there's fun bird powers that have come in, but I don't know if any of them rise to the level of like, oh, I should have done this in the base game. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm happy that we have stuff that's new for each each expansion, right? Like that yeah. makes people to get them. Um, I think in flock mode, we said that people could do um friendly ties for for the round end goals. And that's a little thing that now when I go to score wingspan, I'm like, you want to take your cubes off of the round end goal as you're scoring the goals, but you can't if there are ties. And so it's just yeah. like this <laughs> um a little thing that I notice now when I that's play. interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's true. Um Largely, I don't think like I, I, I often struggle a little bit to come up with like regrets about my games because I, I'm largely happy with how they turned out. But I can think of li little things like that, like the Swift Start guy, but nothing, nothing really big for Wingspan. Um, is this is probably my favorite question I wanted to ask you today because you've come out with other games since Wingspan, some some yeah. wonderful games and some upcoming games as well. Is there anything that you learn from Wingspan, whether it's the process, specific mechanisms, uh, the 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 reception of the game anything like that that you've applied to your other d game designs and if you have any specific examples about those games hmm. I'd, I'd love to hear them anything that you that you've applied to those new games and yeah so you have Tussie Mussy, Mariposas, the Fox Experiment and an upcoming unnamed mushroom Undergrove. Thing? Under, undergrove okay so there's a name okay awesome so yeah anything that you could yeah um, that was, yeah yeah the the mechanic in wingspan where you're giving stuff to other people like just realizing how much people like free stuff and little these <laughs> in the like when it's not their turn yeah. um, that is a mechanic that will show up again in undergrove um 
and was like I hadn't even started out that way and then it, it's with um AEG and I was play testing it with John Zinzer and he was like you need that thing from Wingspan where you can, where people get free stuff on their on other people's turns uh-huh. we do <laughs> perfect year um so I don't know if that was my lesson learned uh-huh. <laughs> but it is now I guess uh any other lessons learned that goes I mean it definitely I think the whole process of how I play test and and Mm -hmm. just like how I structure my uh, game design work like I've developed a lot of relationships with other designers here in DC and Mm -hmm. um like I've known all along the importance of play testing but now I have sort of systems in place to be able to do it better which is really nice can you describe very, very briefly to someone who doesn't know about that, what that looks like? Um, so I have a weekly get together with Matthew O'Malley, who has games with you, uh, Dominic Krapichets from North Star Games, um, and Ben Goldman, who is currently just about to be a freelance game designer, um, but did Paint the Roses is his most recent release um okay. and so the three the four of us get together once a week um and play just each other's games and that's like a huge like everyone can just keep moving forward on their stuff and then um I mean now I have this huge list of people locally who want to play test my games just because they know wingspan um uh-huh. so I can do one-off stuff and then there are other groups that meet like monthly locally. There's one called Break My Game that meets in a local game cafe. And I just, there's something about playtesting with other designers that is just significantly different from playtesting, even, even with other gamers, let alone like playtesting with friends and family will never get you there. <laughs> playtesting <laughs> with other gamers, if they're very thoughtful about how games work and what what works and doesn't in a game might be able to get you there, but playtesting with other designers, you're working with other people who are like really thinking about the inner workings of what's actually happening when they're, you know, so if they hit a point of frustration in a game, first they know how to articulate like what's frustrating them. And then it's fun for them to help you think through how to fix that. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just very, very different from playing with folks who are not in the design process and you don't burn them out because you're doing sort of a quid pro quo and play testing their games. And so they're happy to keep coming and it's, um, yeah, just all kinds of benefits to that process. And something I'm hearing here, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you and I connect on this is that you're play testing in person when you have the choice, right? This is on the tabletop, pencil, paper, components. I remember during the pandemic. I think you shared with me, if I can share this, that they, maybe you struggled a little bit with the separation of everything and the virtual playtesting that a lot of people embraced. I hardly ever virtually playtest. I want my hands on it. I want, the, I want the interface there in front of me. And it's also just easier for me to interact with a game with my fingers instead of a mouse. Yes, uh, both. All of the yeah. above. I have been playtesting. I mean, AEG has sort of an internal process where their developers play once a week online and they have external playtesters too. And so we've been doing a fair amount of undergrowth that way just because they set it up. And like, I'm happy to take advantage of that, but it is not my only playtesting for that game. Like I I do not feel like I have a handle on whether people are actually enjoying a game unless I can watch their faces while they are playing. Uh-huh. And there are all kinds of points in a game where I can see that someone is confused where they might not say it out loud while they're playing online and you would never pick up on it. But if you can watch them at the table, um, you see that kind of thing. Um, there's also, I think, a whole set of physical interactions with physical components that work differently than the way they work on TTS. And there's like little annoying fiddly things in both directions. There are mm-hmm. things that are more annoying on TTS, but there are also things that are more annoying in person. And like, you can't design a game only on TTS. You won't catch some of those things. Um, and yeah, and games on TTS tend to take just 50% longer. <laughs> like you don't get a sense of the, the length. Like there's just all these things that are just different. Yeah. Just inherently different and that the way that you have to zoom in and out on things mm-hmm. versus like what you can actually keep your eye on on a physical table and then i've also noticed what was it oh with um with the fox experiment when it was in mm-hmm. development 
the developer um was doing a lot on TTS and the you can like scale everything on TTS however you want it yeah. and the developer had made this this thing that when I printed it out like did not work on an actual table <laughs> big uh -huh. He just like didn't have a sense for the scale of things relative to each other because on TTS you can just kind of fix it without thinking about it. Yeah. So anyway, yes, many complaints about online. <laughs> <laughs> I strongly, strongly prefer in person, um, and I'm really glad that that is mostly back up and and running. Yeah, same here. That's something that I, I advocate for, and, and uh, I appreciate for pitches. If someone's in Poland and they're pitching a game to me, I like that they can show it to me virtually in that moment. But for playtesting, I love playtesting on the tabletop. I greatly prefer it. Um, I, I, I we're, we're going to wrap up in a minute. But is, is there anything else that you wanted to share? Speaking to people who might be interested in Undergrove, Undergrove or Undergrowth, Under Grove, G R O. Undergrove. Okay. Yep. Anything else, else about that, or anything about uh, that uh, designers that maybe you that's been on your mind as a designer that you think other designers might want to know or find interesting? Uh, either of those, or none of the above. Anything that you want to share? Um, so Undergrove is, we didn't never really backed up and said it. So yeah, yeah. About the fact that mushrooms and trees trade resources underground. Um, and it's going to be on Kickstarter, hopefully in October. Okay. Um, so we're wrapping up playtesting on that. And um, yeah, I'm excited about it. It's it's uh, got a level of spatial awareness and actually a, like a central play area that, that Wingspan doesn't have. But yeah. Um, still like very uh positive interaction no one can like tear down anything that you've built so you're, mm -hmm. you still get that sort of forward progression feelings a little engine building um yeah so i'm excited about that keep an eye out for that anything else for designers you gotta get it to the table <laughs> can't do it in your head <laughs> that's that's great that's advice yeah. yeah yeah ideas are great but execution is is everything yeah and i'm so glad that you executed on wingspan i'm i'm honored to be the publisher honored to, and excited to see what comes in the future of wingspan um thanks for your time today elizabeth i really really appreciate it thanks jamie thanks